Welcome to another Heard at Sports Chat. I'm Anna Bellinghausen, joined by Avery Howard. Avery, thank you so much for joining me today. It's like good old times. Oh, yeah. We've we've Just been here, done times. this. Yeah. We've got lots of topics to dive into today. We do. Um, a big matchup this weekend for your Chiefs. You're a big Chiefs fan. We know that. Casey Kidd, whatever. Um, you guys got the Chiefs Bengals down there. And then, of course, the NFC Eagles 49ers. Let's start with the AFC, though, Avery. Initial surface take of that game. Um, nervous. I'm nervous but just because, okay, I take it back. I'm confident, but I'm nervous just because the track record we have against the Bengals. I, I mean, I know we probably think about it more than they do. I mean, we talked about this, like Burrow literally has ever lost to Mahomes. Like that's crazy. Yep. Um, there's a lot of things that I saw in the AFC championship game last year that concerned me just because we felt like, I mean, as of the game, crazy story, mm-hmm. snuck in. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll have to get to that too. Yeah, we had to talk about that. But the first half felt like we were going to take it and run with it. And yeah. this high-powered, fast-paced offense was going to just keep going. Mm-hmm. And obviously, that last offensive drive we had in the last, or I guess the last play of the first half, really set us back. We needed those points, didn't get them the play call. The whole drama that came from that like really set us up for what we saw in the second half. But just... Our rush defense last week didn't make me feel overly comfortable. Obviously, Pat's injury has made me feel overly comfortable. The Bengals are kind of, I don't want to say they're the underdog in of the playoffs, but like they mm-hmm. weren't the highest ranked team in coming to the playoffs. Throughout the season at all, too. They were right. written off a lot throughout the regular season. Yeah. And I just feel like they continue to prove people and they just pick up momentum yeah. as they go. And, um, you know, what they did to the Bills, obviously, I don't think the Bills put their greatest game, like not even close, yeah. but. That's a tough one. Um, yeah, I just feel like our game plan has to work really well. We have to have the ball the most, and mm-hmm. like he, Burrow just can't get in rhythm early, just can't, and Pat has to. Um, and I'm just curious how much we actually know about his ankle and how much we don't this week. I mean, I know he's doing all the things, and people are trying to make you know pretty big assumptions by mm-hmm. watching him barely stretch and walk and all these things. So yeah. he's going to tell us that he feels fine, but I'm just curious to see how that goes and what happens after that first hit. So I'm I'm confident. I hope arrow through arrowhead will pull through. I'm not concerned about the loyalty there, but I know that, you know, they did it last year. Right. (laughs) And that atmosphere and they've done it to us past three games. So Mm -hmm. it'll be a good matchup. I just hope we can get that monkey off the back. I feel like arrowheads always rocking for sure. And to your point about the statistic you brought up briefly, Joe Burrow is 3-0 and against Mahomes and the Chiefs. He won each game by a field goal, has 982 passing yards and eight touchdowns, just one interception in yeah. those three wins. He's the only quarterback to defeat Mahomes three straight times. But with that being said, it's really hard to beat a team four times. It is. I mean, it's hard to beat a team two times. Yeah. And so here's the thing that's concerning is I feel like in the playoffs, you have to have a good rush game too. Like you have mm-hmm. to. And just a, t- a lot of time management, obviously. When the Chiefs rush the ball, and I think it's we have over 170 yards, I think it is. We've won every game mm-hmm. except for one time. It was against the Bengals. Yeah. We rushed and they still beat us. So, I mean, it's what, what been my field goal every time. So, yeah. no matter what, we know this game's going to be close. Yes. Um, but gosh, we have to get pressure up front and we also have to find a way to incorporate our, our own rush game. But God, that stat really sucks to look at. Yeah. I mean, on paper, it's like, okay, Joe Burrow definitely should win this game. But you think back to the Super Bowl, um, Patrick Mahomes, obviously his toe injury as well during that game. And then you think about the offensive line, that was a lot to blame. Yeah. So I feel like there's a ton of pressure on that O-line and protecting their quarterback. Mm -hmm. And I think... It was in a press conference um, or maybe it was a beat writer that was talking about how much pressure is on that O-line to protect Patrick Mahomes. And that game should kind of piss them off. And the fact that Patrick came out injured in it, you know, yeah. they, they can't let yeah what Patrick Mahomes is, Mahomes is worth go to the ground. And I know. especially during the playoffs. I know. And I, I, I messed up there. 170 yards is a lot. Whenever we rush 70 or more, that's what it was. Okay. We come out successful. And the one time that we've done that this season and did not was against the Bengals. So that's the part. But I think you're completely right. There's a lot of pressure, but I take, yeah. I think they take a lot of pride in it mm-hmm. because they know who they're protecting, but no doubt. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous. What happens if he gets that first hit? Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think, like you said, 
regardless, this will be a close game. It's just so hard to count either quarterback out. It's It feels almost impossible to pick a winner in this. Uh, I'm taking a look at the odds right now. Uh, let's see. So Chiefs are, let's see what the spread is. I, feel like it, I mean, it's got to be what? Oh, yeah. Three so Chiefs are favored just by one point. One point. So Vegas doesn't even know at this point. <laughs> yeah. And you just don't really know in the playoffs. You never know who's going to show up. You never know who's just going to not, you know, not perform under pressure. I read this really interesting thing about Joe Burrow. Um, when he was coming out of high school, one of his sociology teachers um, was talking about his like draft stock or something like that. It was him going into the NFL combine and they're getting all of these um, in quotes. high school. Yeah, in high school. And this sociologist compared Joe Burrow's heart rate between a situation, a high pressure pressure situation versus one that maybe not be so high pressured. And they said he had um, the the heart rate of a first responder, and that when he has these high pressure pressure situations, it's just nothing to him. Yeah, he's Joe Cool. I thought that was really interesting. I was like, dang, imagine yeah. imagine being able to just be that cool at all moments. Right. And on the other side, we have two quarterbacks that I know me and you both like. Mm -hmm. Um, You're an Iowa State fan. Yep. So you like that one. And I think we always just like the underdog story, right? We like the kid. Jalen Hurts. Yep. Yep. That too. Jalen Hurts. But I meant Brock Purdy, obviously. Last pick. Last pick situation. I just think um, the success we're seeing him have when, you know, you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. And we think, oh man, you know, here comes the young kid. Can he take it? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm super excited for this week. And obviously we've, we've chatted a lot about how I feel about Jalen Hurts and just who he is as a player, as a teammate to right. continue to do what he's done, not only at Alabama, but Oklahoma, be consistent. And, you know, we've talked about being doubted mm-hmm. at the quarterback position mm-hmm. for the Eagles and to just kind of like stay the course and he's become that guy for them and just steady. And so I'm excited for that game too. And I feel like we talked about this today that regionally we get the AFC games and regionally that's what the chat, the chitters of chit, 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 chitter, the, the chit chat, chat, the chit chat is all about. Yeah. Um, and we don't get a ton of focus on the NFC. I mean, I know you right. do. Vikings. So, yeah. Don't talk about it. We'll talk oh, about we it will though. Um, and so I, I feel like no one is, yeah, we're talking about Brock pretty, but not necessarily just kind of the turnaround of the Eagles, and just like the come up they've had this season and just right. consistency. Like, I don't feel like there's been a lot of games where people are like even doubting them where like a season or two seasons ago, it would have been like uh, the Eagles. Right. I thought of this analogy earlier this season, but to me, the Eagles are the sleeping giant of the NFL. Yes, they're great. And they've shown it, showed it all year, but I feel like they're not getting enough attention or love from the media. Yeah. And same thing to your point. Maybe it's because we live in Nebraska and we don't yeah. quite see as many of these games, but Eagles 49ers that NFC championship matchup I think is going to be an amazing game and I think don't sleep on the Eagles whatsoever but also don't sleep on this kid Brock Purdy and what he's been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time I think this will be the biggest test of course not only because of the stakes but the team that they're playing um, in the Eagles the defense is just stellar over there and he's really going to be pressured I think in the pocket and I think the Eagles might be able to shut down the rushing game for the 49ers and kind of take away some of Brock's maybe one one or two options. Um, so he's going to have to make maybe some more reads than he's liked to or been comfortable with. But Brock was essentially put into the best position you could possibly ask for as a rookie quarterback backup, coming a third stream backup coming in to the number one defense in the NFL and having all the weapons he has and then having Christian McCaffrey <laughs> Join the, the backfield. Oh my goodness. Like just having that backup, um, backup to him, literally Christian McCaffrey, uh, just being there with him next to him blocking or being able just to hand the ball off to Christian and kind of let loose a little bit more. But Brock hasn't looked flustered or nervous or anything. Yeah. I'm concerned if he's human or not. I don't know. But Brock's been nothing but, but phenomenal. Um, and, and I'm, super impressed I just can't believe that what he's done um and then again to Jalen Hurts and everything that the Eagles have accomplished great offensive line they're just a really complete team yeah um the line right now has the Eagles favored by two and a half points so again it's going to be a close close, it's going to be a close one and I think maybe a little bit higher scoring than people think um given the defenses but I think I think it might be it might come down to a quarterback battle in this one 
you know, you say that about Purdy and there was a, there was a clip of the camera got of him last game mm-hmm. where he came off after a drive and Shanahan kind of ripped into him a little bit. And, you know, you know, the typical got to cover the mouth with the play play sheet. Yeah. Um, but I also just think it kind of proved the relationship those two have. And yes, sure. He's been what a starter for six, seven weeks now. Yeah. You ha- you've got to have that strength and he's been there all year. But I also just think that like, you know, we're not tiptoeing around the kid anymore. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you are the quarterback of the 49ers. Like mm-hmm. you are that guy right now. Yeah. And so like we're not messing around. Like there was just I feel like sometimes when you know you put a backup in, it's like, hey, you know what? Good job. Pat on the back. Like you try. Right. You, you know, we appreciate what you did there. This is like, no, no, no. Like we're taking this seriously. And not that I don't think he would. It's you're in the playoffs and you've mm-hmm. gotten them there. But I think that clip just kind of showed the trust and just the expectation like did not drop just because he went in for this team. Right. And when other players spoke out about Brock Purdy yeah. and it's not like he hasn't been carrying this confidence since training camp. Like this guy has been confident in himself and learning the playbook and taking it very seriously. You know how easy it would be for a third string rookie quarterback to be like, eh, Jimmy Garoppolo and freaking, why can't I think of his name? Um, North, North Dakota state. Oh, uh, Trey Lance. Duh. Sorry. I didn't know where you got it. Yes. Trey Lance. Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. and Trey Lance are both in front of me. And it was very controversial whether or not Trey Lance should be, should have been the starter in the beginning of the season regardless. And then Jimmy, of course, gets hurt. Trey got hurt earlier. Jimmy comes in, whatever. And then Brock has to go in. But you know how easy it would have been for Brock just to sit back his rookie season and really not learn the playbook front and back like he could have or maybe taking a little bit less um, of a charge in practice and in reps and everything like that because he's like, oh, you know, I can I can sit back and learn from these guys for a year or two because no one expected him to play. I mean, last pick in the NFL draft, but that's the best part. Brock That's comes the best in part. with yeah. Brock comes with a chip on his shoulder, and he wasn't highly touted out of high school except for after his senior season. I think he had, um, what did he have? He was sick his junior season. He didn't get to play that much. Didn't get enough looks. And then became Mister Football of Arizona his senior season down there, and then comes to Iowa State, the first D one offer he had ever gotten, and turned down all the other big schools that had wanted him afterwards. Yeah, Brock, I think it's just an amazing story. And how cool would it be to see this guy lift the Lombardi trophy? Can if Brock imagine? Purdy is lifting the, the last pick, <laughs> this would be the last thing I had on my bingo card at the beginning of the season. Brock Purdy lifting the MVP trophy of the Super Bowl. I mean, just imagine that. Oh my gosh. It would be absolutely incredible. Speaking of awards, the NFL released their Ready Say It rant. <sighs> be careful, Avery. Um, no, yes, no, go ahead, rant, go ahead, go might ahead. Be coming. Uh, so NFL released their finalists, um, and one kind of got me worked up a little bit on the coach of the year. So basically everyone was put into this coach of the year award, except for Kevin O'Connell, of course, the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. And I'm, I made my case for him on social media, and I was met with a lot of criticism, which I understand. He had a bad point differential it was a negative point differential I get it but 13 wins on the season you win the NFC North you have 11 one score victories and the largest comeback at 33 points in the history of the league and this man doesn't even get considered I'm not saying he should win I'm not saying he should win but I'm saying he should at least been in the five candidates for NFL coach of the year also it's a regular season award it's not a what you did in the postseason award. Yes, it comes out after the fact, and we know the Vikings choked in the playoffs, of course, story of my life. But when you think back onto this year, it takes a damn good coach to be able to win 11 one-score games. And what really made me upset was people saying, oh, they got lucky. You don't get lucky in the NFL 11 times. I don't care if you're playing the worst team in the NFL. It still takes good coaching and good players and determination to win every single game. It does not matter who you're playing. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Who would you kick out of that final? That was to put KOC. In? Okay. That was also posed to me. And the thing is, is I think that's an unfair question, but I, it think, might be, I'm just curious, but I don't know. I just think Kevin O'Connell should have been a little bit more of a no brainer than people, than people thought. And I think, it's kind of absurd that he wasn't even in those in that five. I'm trying to find the official list right now. Um, but once I do, maybe I can give you, I don't know. I was looking at it and 
every coach seems so deserving and it's so hard to be like right. okay he didn't have this good of a year but I just thought like the story of Kevin O'Connell it's his first season ever as a head coach and he does that he wins the NFC North for a Vikings team that went eight and nine last year that's fair okay Avery looking at the list of coaches Brian Dable from the Giants Sean McDermott from the Bills Doug Peterson Jaguars Kyle Shanahan 49ers Nick Sirianni Eagles <sighs> if I had to kick one out oh my gosh for Kevin O'Connell all of them but um Doug Peterson has to be in I also think Dan Campbell got snubbed I think Dan Campbell could have easily also been in there for the turnaround that he did with the Lions and everything that he worked through um but the only reason I would say Sean McDermott is because the Bills are expected to win I get that but I think it comes down to how we handled the DeMar Hamlin situation was but everything though they had like I read something the other day they had there, I mean, I get this. I guess this doesn't come down to like coaching, but like the same week the Demar Hamlin thing happened, like one of their radio announcers like suffered a stroke or a yeah. heart attack. Mm-hmm. But they had, um, oh gosh, they had like a shooting situation in the beginning of the year. They had another cr- huge injury at the beginning of the year. I read it and I got to figure out where the heck I found it. But like, mm-hmm. you got to coach for a lot. And All then right, Kyle s- Shanahan, I'd kick out then. 49ers. Yeah. Okay. You didn't I, say that one before. Okay. I would say Kyle Shanahan I would kick out if I had to pick. But okay. I don't want to pick, and I didn't pick. That's fair. I asked a pretty tough question, I guess. But Okay. What I was saying before, though, what also made me upset, if you're wondering. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking about Brian Dra- Dable. Jesus. Brian Dable of the Giants. They were like, he worked with nothing. He had no talent. All right. Daniel Jones is not a bad quarterback. Saquon Barkley, last time I checked, it's a pretty good running back. I was just kind of confused on the talent versus the Vikings. Okay, you guys call Kirk Cousins a mediocre quarterback all year, but it's time for the awards, and all of a sudden, Kirk Cousins was the most elite quarterback ever, and Kevin O'Connell didn't do anything. You know, like, how can you say that the Vikings were stacked all year and that Ke- and that KOC wasn't really that big of an impact and that their 13 wins were frauds and their 11 wins, one score wins were, were lucky because you had Kirk Cousins and just, yes, Justin Jefferson. Great. He also got shut down during multiple games and Kevin O'Connell had to figure out how to make his other targets work. He also picked up TJ Hawkinson and found out ways to make him work. Picking up a tight end in the middle of the season is not an easy thing to do. Yes, they're probably more stacked on the wide receivers. You also have to think about Dalvin Cook. But I don't think they're that much more talented than the Giants. And oh, by the way, the Giants beat them. So I don't understand the talent justifying why KOC wasn't on the list. Does that make sense? I understand. Yeah. You can't say that Kirk Cousins was almighty at the end because you were trashing him earlier in the season. And now he's the scapegoat for K for KOC not being on the list. No, it's definitely an understandable argument. And I, yeah, I, I understand exactly where you're coming in. And I think the part that's hard is you kind of want to say, hey, well, like winners win. But like when you look at it being a regular season award, that's when for you it's questionable. I, I think it's totally questionable. Why, why wouldn't he be on the list? 13 wins. Great. 11 one score victories. That was an NFL record. I'm not saying that's something they should hang a banner for, but it takes a good coach to win one score games. Think back to the Nebraska season. Who was losing all the one score games? Did we say it was Adrian Martinez? Did we say it was Casey Thompson? No, we blame Scott Frost because we said it comes down to coaching in those one score games. That's what all the media were saying. They were saying, hey, it comes down to coaching. So why doesn't it come down to coaching when they're winning? And only it's they only blame them when they're losing, but they win a game and it's it's not Kevin, o- Kevin O'Connell. It's not Scott Frost all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, fill in the blank with whoever, but I'm using my hands. I mean, that's how I know I'm upset. No, I think that's a very, very good point um, when you put it that way. Yeah. Um, maybe for our local listeners to understand it. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how it was put. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, moving on, though, let's switch gears to a little bit of college football. Matt Rule was on the Bustin' with the Boys podcast. If you're not familiar with it, Will Compton, former Nebraska linebacker, runs that um, and had Matt Rule on. Pretty cool. About a two-hour show, had Matt on for, what, an hour? Avery, your thoughts from listening to that podcast? I think 
my cousin put it this way. He was like, you know, if you listen to it, you're going to be drinking a whole gallon of Kool-Aid. But I am, I, I'm excited because it's nice to have the face of your Husker football program saying the right things. And we don't know this yet, but I think meaning it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean that more than just being what I hope to be a good coach, but a good person. Yeah. And I think as Husker fans, we've been through the ringer a little bit when it comes to this because we had a good coach and Polini, Mm -hmm. but not always the best person um, in what was portrayed. Yeah. Like what we saw from the media or how the right. media was. And, you know, sometimes, sure, media signs up for and it. And that can be skewed, too. Can it be just skewed. depends how you look at it. I mean, sometimes the presentation yeah, in a press conference, in a halftime interview, don't know if those media people were deserving of it. That's Who my knows? opinion. Yeah. You're right. But sometimes, even interactions and stories that came out, it was just hard sometimes to be like, ah, oh, we're winning games, but ah, oh, it's hard to claim that story. That's my football head coach. Mm-hmm. And With then Polini you're talking yes. about? Yeah. And then you have Riley, who's a great person. Yeah. Not, not, not so the, much the good coach. He just He's a good coach. He just didn't fit with what Nebraska needed at, at the, the moment. At the time. 100%. At the time. And then I think it just, you know, high expectations for Frost. Doesn't end up being a good coach. Not so much the greatest leader. So I think to be able to feel like you have both. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's so hard. We think like, I don't, I don't know. I want to say we think this, but like, there's so many times where it's like, okay, well, it's, they're getting wins. Yeah. Like, okay, they're not the best person or they don't do this in the locker room. It's like, yeah, but when that does. Urban Meyer example. Yeah. Yeah. When that argument was going around. Anyway, I just feel like it's encouraging to listen to a coach as a Husker fan and feel like there's a good person running this football team. And yeah. the thing that stuck with me so many times was just, he talks about how can I preach something to every team I've been a part of when I don't practice it myself. He's like, because Will tried to say, you know, when you when you left the Panthers, and he was like, huh, no, I got fired because mm-hmm. I didn't leave. I got fired. I love how he owns that. He goes, I got fired. He, he doesn't goes, shy away from yeah. his past. And so I think the minute he said that, it just was like it led to the next thing, and he just was like, I have kids. Like, I go, I got to go home and see them after I get fired. You know, and what am I going to do? Take it out on my kids and my wife. They weren't playing the game. They weren't the ones, whatever. And he's like, so you got to be consistent. And I just think the lessons that he was able to share, even on this podcast, it's, you know, pretty laid back, pretty mm-hmm. just chatting with the boys. I think he did a really good job of addressing the questions yeah. um, without beating around it too much, with also just giving, I think, fans a good insight of hopefully what's going to be happening in that side of that locker room. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think he offered a lot of perspective for me about uh, just, just little things, but him talking about the dad perspective, I think was really important. I was talking to my family about this and my uncle was saying, you know, imagine being a 16, 17, 18 year old high school kid and you're either looking to get recruited and you're, or you're in the recruiting process with Nebraska and you hear a, your coach also a dad say that, you know, like I want to give, the kids, the respect and the tools they need to be successful because that makes me successful. Mm -hmm. You know, like why try to be an us versus them situation? Or I also think just talking about what it means to be a father figure Mm -hmm. for his family translates to the locker room if he says, why would I treat them any differently, right? And so that's inspiring, I think, for recruits. And then also if you're already in that locker room right now to hear your coach say like, Hey, when we win and when we lose, like we're going to celebrate and we're also going to be upset, but like, we can't go from here to here. That doesn't Mm -hmm. do anything for you, you know? And so for him to say that, like when I go home after a loss, like, am I going to take it out on everyone else that wasn't included? No, I got to practice what I preach. And so I think there's a lot of that where it's like, you feel like you get a certain presentation of coaches on a screen or players on a screen. And we do this for professional athletes, but who are we really getting, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, that he's like, I'm not what I do. It's it's who I am. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I, yeah. And he's like, people are going to know who I am by what they don't see of me because that's what proves itself eventually. Right. Mm-hmm. So hearing those things is encouraging. Like you take all the football aside. There's a lot of things to look forward to, I think. But knowing that a coach is doing the right way. So I sure drink a lot of Kool-Aid listening to this hour long thing, but I don't think it's empty words. So 
I don't know. I think the boys also did a great job letting him do the speaking without putting him in weird spots. And yeah. also kind of just letting his passion for Nebraska already kind of shine through in a time where he hasn't been there that long. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's what encouraged me from mm-hmm. the whole entire conversation. I love that we got a guy in Nebraska that's not from Nebraska and saw the program from the outside. He went to Penn State. He got to see the program and he had to watch Nebraska be the powerhouse that they once were in the 90s and the 80s and a little bit in the 2000s as well. So he's seen it and he understands the pride that comes with Nebraska. And I'm sure he quite literally um, is engulfed in it every single moment going to all those small towns. Like the end means so much more in Western Nebraska and in central Nebraska, where it might be one of the only things that they have, or it might be one of the only things that some people look forward to seeing on Saturdays. And he definitely has to understand that. And I think he does. And it shows in how he talks about the commitment he wants to have to the program. And you see it with him out recruiting every single day in every little part of the state going to basketball games, going to camps, going to whatever it may be, taking pictures with fans and um, going to houses with players and playing ping pong and eating homemade food and stuff like that. That takes a special person. And it tells me he's not too big for this job. He's been in the NFL. He's been at the pinnacle of what he thought he would be at his career. And he failed. And I think it's so cool to have a guy that's been at the top and failed and come back to a place where he knows he can belong. And I know he has a different perspective from coming out of Carolina fired and having probably not the best experience there with the Panthers and still being able to rally himself and keep his beliefs and keep being the person that he, who he is and bring that to Nebraska. And I wish him yeah, success, of course. That brings me to an important thing that he said is he said, when I got fired, players drove to my house to check on me and my family Mm -hmm. and he goes take it for what it's worth but at least let me know that I at least made a connection with these players while I was there yeah and that I hopefully did something enough to let them know that I care about them and their success Mm -hmm. that they were willing to come check on me and my family when this whole decision went down super cool and also on top of that he was like you know even if I got offered in the NFL again I don't know if I would take it because I didn't like the harshness of having to just cut players one day. Mm -hmm. He's like, I care about, you know, their livelihood and like their success. And then when someone comes down and tells me I have to make a decision that I don't really want to make, he's like, it doesn't feel very fair to me. And just just because why we got to make money moves, Mm -hmm. you know, like this is someone's life. This is a human. It's a business in the NFL. And I get the NFL. Like, you know, if you're making it, then you ain't making it. But like, he's got to be the one to be put in those situations where we, as we know him, he's a developer. And so he wants to see, you know, when it gets tough and you're still working, I'm not just going to cut you now, but mm-hmm. I got to because big boss says so, you know? So yeah. I think that tells me about his passion for kids. Mm-hmm. And I know Andrew and DB sat on their show and like, this is, you know, kind of what Andrew said is in DB's wheelhouse. Like, you know, if we have a passion for them, why won't they have a passion for us? Yeah, It's all about the young people. Right. And so I think you pour into them, they'll pour into you. And so I, I think we say that, but then we don't always see it. So to hear a coach have prime examples of it, right. Mm-hmm. Um, you get fired and, and your own players are coming to check on you. He was even there. What for, you know, half a season. Yeah. Right. So you only awesome. had, that's awesome to hear. I didn't know that. Yeah. The players came and checked on him. That's yes. Really cool. And so I think that goes to say, goes to show you just the kind of connection that he strives for to have with his players. And mm-hmm. that's when people fight for you. Right. And I think if, and even he, he said it on the show, he was like, I, he's like, I'm already past step one with this team. He goes, mm-hmm. fortunately, he goes, I got to watch them for a good portion of the season because the position was out there that long. He's like to go through the losses and just the drama of losing your head coach. Yep. And like, the close losses you guys have had two years in a row, but then even last season, he's like, and then you have something in your locker room that gets these boys to go out and beat your rival on the last game. And it means nothing to you, mm-hmm. but you kick Iowa out of a big 10 championship game. He goes, that makes me know that I'm already passed up on with this group. I don't got to ask them to fight, mm-hmm. you know? And Will Compton's like, Oh man, he got me fired up. He got me going. <laughs> I'm through a brick wall right yeah. now. So I think that's exciting. He recognizes what's there and he recognizes what needs to be done, but he knows yeah. how to connect, which as a, you know, ex-athlete, like that's the stuff you love to hear. Like I want to mm-hmm. have that connection with my coach. The number one thing I always say about a coach or any leader for that matter of fact is knowing that they care. <laughs> there is no better person that you want to work for more than someone that you know cares about you, that cares about your family, that cares about where you came from and your beliefs and your values. 
And that seems to be, at least on paper and from what we've seen in the media, what Matt Rule is. Of course, we don't know this. We can't confirm it. We will find out as the season starts and and progresses. (laughs) And um, I think, actually, Avery, we'll find out in the first one-score game of the Husker season of what kind of coach he is. Because I think, again, back to my Kevin O'Connell point, it comes down to those close games. You can't win close games unless you don't think that coach believes in you and trusts you. Yes, fair. I'm just meaning we have what? Minnesota, Colorado to open up the season? That's So I think we'll find out early, but understandable what your point is. is yeah. It, here's the difference. Can, do we have a coach that can do it versus what we've seen in the past? Right. And I love how Rule was like, I'm not never going to be the guy to have cameras on me during a player meeting. I know. Slide right at uh, Deion Sanders. Yeah, and then they were, and then they kind of fully. Yeah, they got it, and he's like, "No, no, no lots of respect for him." Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I mean, I would I want a player meeting recorded? No, that should be between you and the players. I mean, I'm not going to get into that topic, but personally, keep the cameras away. Why would you even want that? Stand up. There? Sit down. Stand up. Yeah, that was rough. All right, geez. Now that we're all happy, let's close this out on a sad note. Um, three years ago. We would be remiss to not say Kobe Bryant passed away in a tragic helicopter accident. And Avery and I were talking before the show just about the gravity of the situation and how the world seemed to kind of stop at that point. Avery, you were in Shields, which is a sporting goods store, if you're unfamiliar, in Nebraska when this happened. Tell me about your experience. Well, we were talking and it was like, it was one of those um where were you moments Mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I mean I guess I don't feel like I've had a lot of those and we were on the way to Shields and my brother goes "Mm, TMZ just said that Kobe got in a helicopter accident and naturally I was like okay well that I'm sure what you know just fake what to do with TMZ and then we got into Shields and I want to say it was on a Sunday and so busy day people are out with their families and but it felt weird. Like it was kind of like everyone was kind of waiting because everyone had just seen, even though the TMZ thing had come out, it was TMZ. Mm-hmm. Like everyone had known because it was just was like an ominous vibe. It was weird. And all the TVs went from like a game yeah. to like pitch black on the TVs at Shields. And we were by the um, professional gear because we were getting my grandpa at Chiefs, like AFC something. Like we were, it was that time of the year, obviously, right mm-hmm. now. And, um, then all the screens turned back on and it was on the news of literally like it had just come out mm-hmm. and I think it was either broken into sports center or whatever it was, but literally the TVs went black, mm-hmm. turned back on. And I literally think th- they went off because Shields was trying to like change the TVs, whatever came back on. And at this moment I took a picture of it cause it was so crazy. I'm standing next to the Kobe's Jersey in the big of all the because jerseys. they got all the jerseys yeah. so like the chiefs were right here and then nba is like facing it and this guy is standing right next to the jersey and he looks at the tv and he like just puts his hand over his mouth and he grabs an eight jersey and a 24 jersey and then like continues to keep watching tv and people start like flocking to his jerseys and mm-hmm. they're grabbing more than one and then um there was two shields workers like by me just watching the tv and then one of the guys like told another girl to like go to the back or whatever they call it, the store or what do we call it? Mm-hmm. I can't even think. The storage, yeah. Storage and like go grab more Kobe jerseys. And wow. they were like changing the display and stuff. And this little kid and his mom came up and like it just was cr- it was just like, is this actually happening? And yeah. it was it was an athlete that I feel like we kind of grew up with, but we never really caught him, I feel like at his prime at our age where we would have been old enough to been like yeah, truly, to, to truly invested where he came his from, value yeah. of his. Yeah. And but you always knew his name. You knew Co- you yeah. knew Kobe and yeah. you watched him. And so to watch, like, I think the next generation above me be at Shields and watching the TVs, it was just like, I mean, for anyone, obviously, but yeah. watching people. But that was like, we're Gen Z. Yeah, that was a millennial. Like yeah. that was. Yeah, it was your, Michael Jordan. Your, yeah, yeah. You're Jordan and you're yeah. Brian. And so just to sit there and watch like people taking the jerseys off the rack and grabbing mm-hmm. more than one of them. And then not only grabbing a number eight, but grabbing a number 24 and yeah. like this mom and his kid, like just sitting there and he wanted the Jersey and she was like, yeah, yeah. Grab multiple. And it just, but everyone else was not shopping. Mm-hmm. Everyone was stuck on a TV. And so it was just like a very yeah. creepy 
almost like you're in a huge shopping. Yeah. Like, it is just the like, biggest sports really weird, shop. Yeah. And it just, oh God, it was the craziest thing. And then just kind of watch people react to it in mm-hmm. real time. Because everyone's reacting and absorbing the information at the same time. Yeah. It was, I literally, no one knows a, how to feel. I took a picture of it. And like the TV's in the background with the news. And then there's a guy like standing at the Kobe thing, like grabbing it, like as he's watching. And it Jeez. just, I know, very, very weird moment. Um, but it's That's weird crazy. to think it was three years ago. Mm-hmm. I know if it, I don't know if it feels longer or shorter. The years 2020 and 21 mix in my head all the time because of the quarantine stuff and how long that went on. And I don't know, but yeah, three years ago. Wow. It's, it, yeah. you can't not mention it. I mean, it's bigger than basketball, obviously. And it's not a day to debate whether Kobe Bryant's in the top five or the top three or not. Um, I think those debates are silly. I think every player is just one in their own and the decade that they play. And it's like comparing oranges to apples of who is better. Like the Jordan LeBron debate, I think is a tough one too, but yeah. And not to get off topic in a weird way, but like the comparisons these days, it's like who was better, Michael Jordan or Tom Brady? What are we we talking about? Like Michael Jordan's a freak athlete and Tom Brady can barely run, but yeah. like they're amazing athletes. Like right. why, why are we talking about that at all? I know the comparisons oh. of athletes, you, your brain, I feel like just as a human automatically will make comparisons. And I mean, I make comparisons all the time in my head. I'm like, Oh my God, who's going to be the next, this, who's going to be the next that. And everyone wants to be that of course, but you have to just be okay with not knowing you know, like it's okay to not have that next Tom Brady because I don't think we'll ever see. I, I don't know. Maybe we will another Tom Brady and what he had accomplished and the championships he won. And maybe that's going to be Patrick. Let's Holmes, just, but like, but, let's just keep it there real fast. Like, even if it is, they're not comparable. Yeah, because, and the, and because the, of who and, they played and, with. Yeah, and like, but even like, okay, sure. Let's say stats wise, like Patrick. Let's just say passes what Tom Brady sets mm-hmm. yards and receiving touchdowns and Super Bowl numbers. Yeah. Okay. They did it completely differently. Yeah. With like, different teams, different, different coaches. Teams. But like y- you watch Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes playing a game against each other. Mm-hmm. They're playing. They're both playing quarterback, but they're not playing court- like the same position. Oh, yeah. You know, it's different. So it's just like why? Like we can we can. I just feel like the vocalizing of the comparisons is just detrimental. And I know that yeah. Patrick would be like, I don't really care. Yeah. But at one point, like, can we just let them be them and like right. be the athlete that they are without mm-hmm. having to be like yeah but you weren't this mm-hmm. or but like hey you're a rushing like you're a rushing quarterback but you don't have this me passing yards yeah you're right i don't because i don't do that yeah uh, uh, everyone's different in their own way and obviously tom brady patrick mahomes only one of them's in the playoffs right now and it's mahomes and it's i love it because it is especially in this um quadrant of nfc afc teams that are left young quarterbacks uh-huh. and it's the young guns that are getting their opportunities. I mean, you got the youngest one, of course, in Brock Purdy. And then you have Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts. It's like the new era of football. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they said like Patrick is like the oldest and he's 27. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the coming of age of football. And it's crazy because Brock's only 22. Like we're 22. I'm 23. Okay. You're 23. That's you're scary. older than Brock. That's scary. Imagine us being in the NFL right now. No, thanks. No, thank you. I don't want to be hit. By Imagine in on the NFL. Could have been. Could have been. What could have been? That would have been great. <laughs> great quarterback, by the way, if you ask me. Also, I want to bring up, how did you sneak into the AFC Championship? Oh, my gosh. You should okay. have led with this. I know. We should have. Shit. Okay, so speaking of the AFC, cha- AFC Championship, it's like deja vu. Like, I probably should go back and try to do it again. Okay, when I say sneak in, like, so crazy. So my friend that goes to Lincoln, huge diehard Chiefs fan as well. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to go back to... KC this weekend because my dad wants to go tailgate like the weather's supposed to be nice like just being the atmosphere like tailgating Kansas City is like untouchable like I don't it's really like college football and steroids. I don't care like what team you're part of like I will fight you on this one like we have the parking lot for it there's nothing else around like it's what you do people tailgate in the line before it's open like you set mm-hmm. up 10 it's just what you do it was it was gonna be a nice day sunny I'm like I want to be in the atmosphere I've been gone at college for four years when we've been having the success like yeah. I want to be around it so we literally take off like pretty sure like midnight Saturday here, get back to KC next morning. You are up and at it. I think we had the, what is it? The two thirty or two o'clock three twenty five game, whatever the heck it is. Mm-hmm. And we're just enjoying the day. Like we've got friends everywhere. We're going from tailgate to tailgate. Like they've got live music, whatever. 
the game before was the Bills game. So they were calling him like the Grim Reaper, the 13 mm-hmm. seconds. We've got Grim Reaper people like hanging uh-huh. out everywhere. There's like all kinds of things, like just super fun atmosphere. And the game's getting closer. My dad's like, shoot, like, should we go? And I'm like, I mean, I'd love to, but ticket prices for these, t- like this game is like $1,200 a ticket right oh now. Gosh, yeah. like, it's it's not even worth it at that point. Like I'd rather just enjoy this atmosphere and go watch somewhere else unless we're guaranteed to win this game and we're going like, this is a super, like I just, whatever. So my dad's like, well, let's start asking a few people if they've got extras or whatever. And so we're always like, or we'll just wait till the game starts, see if the tickets just go down like crazy. Mm-hmm. And so my friend texts me as people are literally lining up. She's like, Hey, our friend has two extra tickets or whatever. No way. And we're gonna like send them over to you electronically. I'm like, oh my god! But like, we had th- we had three people. My dad's like, okay, like we'll take these two tickets. But like, we've got it. We we're not we're gonna buy what one twelve hundred dollar ticket, right? And so we're just looking and looking, and prices aren't going down; they're going up. Oh like, god! As the game's starting, and so we're like, oh, shit, okay. So here comes the flyover, fireworks, whatever. And so we're like listening to the game outside. We're literally like the standing like everyone else that's looking for tickets we're all like seeing yeah. the porter potties whatever right and technically we've had two tickets but there's three of us and then but the electronic transfer is taking forever he's like it's sending it sending it sending it sending and then my dad's like holy shit he sent us three tickets what and we were like what how do you send us three tickets like you thought he had two or whatever my dad's like let's just go up there like he just sent us three tickets like maybe he had an extra they didn't use like yeah. literally so we get up there one scans I'm like okay my friend walks in the next two eh, eh, whatever and oh, the guys no. and my dad's like oh, wait why is that and the guy goes well it's saying that your tickets already been scammed but like there's no way because like this one you got this other one like hasn't yet it's like that you guys are fine like you guys are fine but what? The, my dad was like okay like i just want to make sure because like i don't know why she whatever and he was like yeah i don't know why it's saying that like you guys you have the three tickets like whatever we get in there what a bro what a bro we get in there and but my dad's basically like, as he's talking my dad's like just go like you're fine whatever not really thinking much of it we get in there and we go to the seats that these tickets are whatever literally the friends that had sent us the tickets they're sitting in those seats <gasps> so instead of sending us the three extras he literally sent us the three that they were already using oh oh no so we don't actually know like where the extra were coming from or where the two extra seats literally were because they there was not an so open where'd you, yeah where'd you go so, because literally like my dad's like you guys they had already been scanned because they scanned them. Right. Like, these are his legit tickets. Yeah. So I kid you not, Anna, we were standing in like little stairwells moving as the game was going on because the people, the security at the whatever, like they don't let you congregate like right. in the stairs. So we were literally on the side of the, of the stadium where the sun was shining. So we were literally just like going from like stairwell to stairwell. Like, cause Watching, if you were in the yeah. sun, it was warmer. And my dad was like, you guys, we literally just snuck into the AFC championship. So there's little corners at the top of each corner of the stadium that have like behind the last row is just basically cement and it's just like a little landing basically mm-hmm. like where you can't have because we have wall like a wall yeah so i'm looking we go up this one alley but i'm like guys like there's no one standing up there we were at the highest point of the stadium <laughs> behind the last row of chairs oh, wow. and there's just a huge cement, like it's a huge cement block mm-hmm. and like other people if they don't want to sit like they'll stand back there yeah so, like people that were like on the last row and they can't sit because they can't see mm-hmm. they were standing back there and the sun was shining on us like literally we were the one patch of like sun left like, jesus it, it was it was like you were meant to be here <laughs> but literally it was crazy and we were my dad was like do you guys realize that we would have paid almost like as the ticket prices were going up as the game he was oh like, yeah like five thousand yeah. dollars yes. at least and we were in there for like my dad's like this man should lose his job but it was insane and we were like winning confidence was through oh, the roof man so we're my dad's like we, that's so electric it was crazy but if you don't we're the very very top part of the stadium yeah. my dad's like at the beginning of the fourth quarter he's like we're working our way down mm-hmm. because at this time the, the game's getting close and my dad's like win or lose it will take us two hours to get out of here because we're the last people in the stadium right now like yeah. we're the highest part our car's over here we're up here uh-huh. and so we start working our way down and we start my dad kind like of, trying to find another seat that but just start working down and like yeah. my dad's like if we if we tie this game up like we're going what was it did we lose in overtime in the last afc championship 
I want to say we lost. I can't. I I wish I could remember, but literally we were like sprinting from concession, little to concession, to like catch it as we Uh were like trying to move down because my dad's like, we're never gonna get out of here. I want to say it was because we had an overtime with Bills and overtime with the Bengals. Yeah, you guys won. No, the Bengals, silly. I went to the Bengals game. Oh, 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 oh. I want to say because we went from overtime game to overtime game. Oh yeah, you lost. Yeah. Yeah, of course. That's why it was devastating. Like, it was the coolest experience ever, but like we lost. Mm-hmm. But it was just the craziest thing ever. Like the whole time we're like texting. I'm texting my mom. She's like, okay, what's your this plan? You guys coming back? Where should we go? My dad's like, sent her a picture and she was like, WTF basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think we didn't score on our first drive down. And then I think they went back and kicked a field goal basically. It was like 27-24 maybe. Let's, let's double check. But all these people were trying to congregate like by this one concession. 27, 24 overtime. Yeah. 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 Bengals scored a field yeah. goal. Yeah. And I looked at the, see, I don't know what year it is. I looked up the 2021 AFC championship. Yeah. I know it's confusing, but I don't know what year it is ever. I know. So anyway, we were like, my dad like started sweet talking this little security guy basically to like, mm-hmm. let us stand there and like, just have casual conversations. Yeah. And as he's having casual conversation, like me and my friend are like inching closer to like where the seats are to like look down mm-hmm. because they don't, like I said, they don't let you stand by the stairs. Like if you're standing there too long, they're like, Hey, either go to your seats or like, please keep moving. Mm-hmm. And so we came down and we just made our way from section to section watching the end of the game. And then we like sprinted out of there. But that's awesome. The craziest thing. Like my dad was like, we just snuck into the AFC <sighs> championship game and lost. Yeah. But it, it Still, was crazy. Just experience it. Gosh, it was crazy. I want to go down there this weekend pretty badly, but I don't know if we'll be able to, but just to experience the environment. I mean, I know. There's nothing like I it. Know. Our friend Sydney Schneider is getting to photographer, be a photographer at it, which mm-hmm. is like so crazy. Like, I mean, she told me her job like during the NFL game. Like, little is she enjoying the game much? Very little. Yeah. That girl's sprinting right. the whole time, but like, is she gonna be on the field cow. photographing? She gets like certain little pockets. Like, there's like little areas. She's got to go to that like top corner where I was the mm-hmm. one time to get like the full shot. Right. But then she's also like, there's a little cutout for her to like get, and she's like kind of in the fans, mm-hmm. but kind of not. That's also fun, though. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. It's great being on the field, but it's also cool to be able to... Like, the shot she's going to get from this game? Like... Oh, my gosh. I can't wait for her. That's awesome. I know. I'm so happy for her. But, like, I got experience as a fan, and I and I know you probably take it in a little bit more. Yeah. But, like, when you're... Oh, yeah, of in course. The, but then when you're working and you've got the responsibilities, but to, like, know yeah. that you're working a part of that game, oh, like... So fun. I just love football. Football's just the best sport in the world. Is it not, Avery? just watching you soccer <laughs> no because every time i look at you it's the wrong way because my my thing is mirror oh, yeah so i can't look at you no i love football i love soccer love playing it but football's it's not that yeah it's not really up said from base. a soccer player herself avery howard yeah i'll say it <laughs> all right well this has been a herd at sports chat for avery howard i'm anna bellinghausen thank you so much for joining us can't wait to see how these afc nfc championships play out let's go A Herd at Sports Network production.